So thank you for coming. We spend a little time uh, talking in a general way about the color of the ocean. And this is a topic that uh, for so many centuries has been a source of fascination for uh, artistic people and for explorers and for fishermen. Uh, for example, um, uh, fishermen have known for so many years that uh, differences in the color of the water uh, contain information that is useful to them. And a particular group that was uh, noted for this was the captains of the ships that uh, used to sail to hunt the great uh, whales. One of these um, is this gentleman, uh, William Scoresby, who was a contemporary of Charles Darwin. And he became uh, fabulously rich in the uh, whaling business so that he retired um, very early uh, in his 40s. He became a doctor of divinity and he became a gentleman scientist, fellow of the Royal Society and published many papers uh, with uh, famous scientists such as uh, James Jewell. And in his uh, native place, he, they still remember him, and as you can see at the bottom right, they named the beer after him. Anyway, he uh, had written books uh, in which he talked about the relationship between the color of the water and the food of the whales. And another uh, individual who was prominent in this story is Alistair Hardy, who amongst other things um, invented the continuous plankton recorder. He painted most of the pictures that illustrate this talk. But early in his career, he was appointed as a zoologist on the uh, Discovery Expedition, British Expedition to the Antarctic and his particular a uh, job was to study the relation between whales and plankton. And no doubt that he would have been fully familiar with the writings of William Scoresby. So another of his um, early uh, adventures was uh, happened in 1923 when he was, in his first job, he was um, uh, appointed by the uh, fisheries ministry in, in the UK to study um, the small pelagic fish. And he had the idea to make an aerial survey in one of these very uh, small planes of the time an aerial survey to see if they could find the, uh, identify the shoals of small pelagic fish such as herring and uh, mackerel. And he, by the way, his uh, experience in this aircraft, uh, his idea to use the aircraft was no doubt a consequence of his experience during the First World War when, amongst other things, he was an observer for the uh, embryonic uh, Royal Air Force uh, and so he would have had direct uh, experience in th this kind of aircraft. So the place uh, you see here is the southwest of England and you can see Plymouth, where Shubra and I uh, are living, marked. And so this was the area that uh, Hardy uh, surveyed. And his idea to identify the shoals of uh, fish 
was, was a complete failure. However, he did notice these very um, uh, distinct uh, zones of the area where the water was of uh, uh, different colors. And he particularly noted this line between the green water of the English Channel and the deep blue water that was coming from uh, the, um, the Atlantic Ocean. So he was particularly struck by these uh, color differences. And when he wrote his famous book, uh, The Open Sea, this is a book that came out in 1956. He wrote, if these color changes can be correctly interpreted, we may in the future find aircraft being used to make rapid surveys of surface conditions in relation to fisheries. So this was a very uh, forward-looking uh, idea. And of course, in that sentence, uh, the key thing is um, if the color changes can be correctly interpreted. It turns out that uh, his um, thinking has, has become uh, much more than a reality because it's not just a small aircraft are being used now to look at the ocean color, but this, this is something that uh, is routinely done using instruments carried on spacecraft orbiting the Earth. So he was uh, thinking ahead of his time. Now, um, there comes a point where the we have to deal with this question, can the, can the color uh, changes be uh, correctly interpreted? And uh, so then we realize that uh, there are scientific conclusions to be drawn from the uh, differences in color of the ocean. And the reason is that the, the color of the ocean, when it's quantified, in a, in a rigorous uh, physical way, contains information about the abundance of the marine microflora, in other words, the phytoplankton. And although these are in, invisible to the naked eye, even when you have a sample uh, very close, their collective impact is easily visible uh, from uh, using instruments um, observing from uh, space. So uh, to understand a little bit more, we have to review the properties of the phytoplankton uh, that are relevant to this story. Um, they're single-celled uh, and they are microscopic. Um, in the size range from just below one to perhaps uh, 250 microns. They are green plants in the sense that they, are, they contain chlorophyll pigment and they, their mode of nutrition is photosynthesis, just like uh, terrestrial plants. So they have all the same metabolism but all, all uh, functioning within a single-celled organism. And they're distributed uh, everywhere at the surface. And for most of the world's ocean, they actually control the color of the ocean. So when you see um, color differences, uh, in, in the ocean water far from land, it's a reasonable conclusion to uh, that um, these color differences are caused by differences in the abundance and as we, as we shall see, the kinds of phytoplankton. Now because they grow by photosynthesis, 
they are consumers of carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide, of course, in the accumulating in the atmosphere is a, a, a causal factor in climate change. So that therefore gives phytoplankton um, a role in the, uh, not just in the ocean's carbon cycle or the Earth's carbon cycle, but also in the uh, climate change um, arena. Because the collective metabolism of phytoplankton is very great. On a world scale and on an annual scale, they process some 50,000 million tons of carbon. It's a massive flux. And it's uh, just uh, an integration of the activity of uh, small cells that by virtue of their smallness are metabolically uh, very active. Now, uh, we can think of the marine ecosystem as a machine, or if you like, as a thermodynamic system. It's a dissipative system. It means that uh, it has to be sustained by regular supply of energy from the sun. And this energy source in the sun is coupled to the ecosystem by the pigment molecules contained in phytoplankton. So the pigments of phytoplankton are the agents or the interface by which the entire marine ecosystem is connected to its energy source. And there, then we can have in the ocean a biogeochemistry. And if we, if we didn't have this method to capture solar energy and then uh, use it to, to do work that's useful for the ecosystem, we would only be talking about geochemistry. Now, the light that... Um, by one way or another, uh, escapes from the surface of the ocean, carries information, perhaps in code, that is useful for ocean biology and biogeochemistry. So how does that work? There are two uh, principal optical processes uh, involved. One is uh, absorption of light, and the other is um, scattering. And these um, processes, uh, uh, absorption, for example, uh, can be through water, pigments, uh, organic material in solution, uh, detritus, or um, abiogenic uh, particles. Uh, scattering by phytoplankton, by water, and by other particles. So both of them are wavelength dependent, and they can be described by strict uh, physical equations that uh, generally uh, we refer to as radiative transfer theory. So because of the backscattering, scattering in the backward direction, as you can see in, in the top left-hand side. Uh, photons are able to escape from the surface of the ocean, uh, escape in an upward direction, and these are the photons that are the basis of the signal captured by the radiometers uh, flying in space. So, uh, really is not so complicated, uh, mostly two basic optical processes. Now, the, the 
The process of scattering uh, was a controversial uh, matter in the history of physics. And here we see uh, pictures of the three of the famous physicists uh, involved. On the top left is uh, John Tyndall. He was Irish. And uh, he uh, implicated scattering as a, a causative agent. The one on the right is uh, Lord uh, Raleigh, who was a very famous uh, physicist. And his view was that uh, if you saw color in the ocean, let's say a blue color in the ocean, it was because the ocean was reflecting the color of the sky. Now, the man at the bottom left, uh, he did not agree. So uh, he uh, contested this, and uh, he said that um, whereas Raleigh had said it was simply the blue of the sky seen by reflection, uh, that um, uh, this was not so, and that it was a scattering phenomenon, and that one of the scattering agents, uh, at least one of the scattering agents, uh, would be the molecules of the water themselves. So this man, I just show you again, uh, he is uh, C.V. Raman, and uh, he uh, was later awarded the Nobel Prize for his work in scattering. And of course, he was the dis he discovered in his work on scattering the process of Raman scattering. So uh, scattering is uh, is the thing, not reflection of the sky. And you can see uh, a couple of um, examples here. The top left uh, picture is uh, has a, uh, a collimated beam of light entering at the top of that uh, glass cylinder. The water contains uh, scattering centers, and you can see the beam spreading as it uh, progresses down the cylinder uh, and uh, changes the color uh, in the act of this uh, spreading. Now, in the sea, we certainly have scattering agents, and one of them is the, um, is the group of organisms called uh, coccolithophores, uh, which are armored with plates made of calcite. The, the, this uh, is an example at the bottom left. That's uh, very few microns across. If you go to the shop that's, uh, I think, in the next building, there is somebody is selling a model of those things. So they are coccolithophores, calcifying organisms, as if you listened to yesterday's um, plenary lecture. So there, the effect of these calcite plates is to scatter the light. And you can see in the picture on the right shows an oceanographic front in the Gulf of Alaska. On the left side of the front, uh, you can see uh, highly scattering water. And on the right side, which is, uh, d does not contain the coccolithophores, you can see the color is altogether different. Uh, left side here, that's an example, um, a large scale view from space of a coccolithic bloom in the Barents Sea. And on the right side, you can see uh, these things being entrained in the uh, Malvinas uh, current of uh, Patagonia. So th those are some examples of the effect of light scattering uh, in the ocean, but light scattering by phytoplankton. Now, um, here is another one. Um, you see, this is this, the, the land here is the southwest coast of England and the northwest coast of France. 
And you can see off the French coast, you see the coccolithophore bloom. And on the near, the near the top right, you'll see some pink water uh, coming out of, uh, of a river. That, that place is called the Bristol Channel. And the, there you will see some sandstone uh, sediment, which is turning the water that uh, rose color. So what I want to emphasize here is this picture is, is what is known as a true color picture. It means that the optical signals uh, captured by the spacecraft are showing the image as closely as possible uh, to what we would see with our naked eye. It can't be exactly the same because the spectral response of the instruments are not the same as our eye, but it's pretty close as you can see from the color of the land. Now, um, not all of the ocean color pictures you see are the so-called true color ones. In fact, the true color pictures are the minority. Here is a picture of the uh, Northwest Arabian Sea. And on the left side, you see the true color picture. In the water, there's, there's uh, not very much to see. It's rather boring. However, on the right, the image has been processed to uh, recover uh, the concentration of chlorophyll. So what you see, the colors on the right-hand side, is a color-coded picture showing gradations in the, in the concentration of chlorophyll. Um, we refer to this as a false color image. You can see at the near the right bottom on, on that uh, picture, you'll see a color scale that's showing you um, the, the yellow, orange, and red colors represents higher chlorophyll concentration, and the blue colors represent uh, uh, lower concentrations of chlorophyll. So this is... Um, this is a false color or ocean color image, and this is the kind of image we'll talk about for most of the rest of the talk. You can also see in that picture that the phytoplankton, or the chlorophyll, is serving as a tracer for the circulation. So that coast, for example, is... Uh, has a train of eddies uh, running through, and you can see those um, uh, traced by the um, uh, chlorophyll. So it's a much, less, a much less boring picture than the one on the left-hand side. It contains, contains far more uh, of oceanographic interest. Now, um, these kind of images form the basis of, um, of, the, of the field of ocean color um, uh, science. Uh, chlorophyll concentration, which is the, the principal thing that we can extract from the images, has been declared uh, a so-called essential climate variable by the UN Framework Convention on uh, Climate Change. And the, you'll see that the, um, the images are very beautiful, but that should not um, uh, make you forget that they are based on very strict um, uh, radiative transfer theory. And they are open to um, many applications, as we are going to see. One of the things you might think about is that these 
uh, images show in a differential way the degree of coupling between the ocean ecosystem and its energy source. If you think about it that way, the, the pictures are of uh, very fundamental importance. So the images are based on the spectral absorption of light by pigments. So we might then think about what happens to this light once it's been absorbed. And one, uh, one thing that happens to the absorbed light is it gets used for photosynthesis, uh, the so-called uh, primary production. This is the, this is the carbon flux that, that supports the entire, or virtually the entire ecosystem. So, uh, as well as being, as well as the chlorophyll being a key property of the marine ecosystem, then the primary production is also uh, a key property. So, how do we do that? Um, we have to um, we have to make a detailed description of the light field in the ocean and that varies uh, different times from different one time of the day to another. And it varies from one depth to another as the light penetrates the ocean. It becomes progressively absorbed. And the, as it becomes uh, attenuated with depth, the spectral uh, composition changes. So it's a rather complicated story to keep track of the, um, of the light field in the ocean. But if we do that, and if we have uh, some information about the, the photosynthetic response of phytoplankton to the available light, such as you can see in the bottom left, then uh, on a depth by depth basis, we can calculate the photosynthesis and we can integrate it over depth and we can integrate it uh, throughout the day and we can end up with a rather good um, estimate for the daily production uh, of the ocean uh, water column. And we can do this on a global scale uh, such as this one, is a, a recent one, uh, is the uh, computed uh, daily production. This happens to be for the month of May. And it happens to have been made using a new data set for um, uh, ocean color, the so-called ocean color climate change initiative data for which uh, Schuber is the chief scientist. And it, that project has just uh, begun, just means within the last 12 to 18 months, begun to issue uh, these beautiful data sets that are freely available to anybody who wants to make use of it. This is an initiative of the European Space Agency. Now, um, when you uh, look into the details of calculating prime production from uh, uh, at large horizontal scale, as I've just been talking about, um, and you, uh, you look where the weaknesses are in the story, um, one of the things that we need to know is the ratio of the carbon to the chlorophyll inside the phytoplankton. So it turns out that this is a, a difficult thing to measure, uh, especially in the field, uh, but, it, but nevertheless, it's a very um, uh, essential piece of information uh, for uh, 
ecological modeling. It's difficult to measure because although you can measure carbon and although you can measure chlorophyll, uh, it's very difficult to know how much of the carbon and how much of the chlorophyll is indeed uh, contained in uh, living phytoplankton uh, and not in other taxa and not in the form of detritus. So one of the uh, ways that um, can be used to make a, a, a good estimate of the carbon to chlorophyll ratio is to make the assumption that when you uh, plot a particulate carbon that would be measured in a standard way against uh, chlorophyll concentration, the points that uh, fall near the lower boundary of the envelope, in other words, those for which the uh, carbon is lowest for a certain chlorophyll concentration, those would be the points that uh, truly reflect the conditions in the phytoplankton themselves. So this, is, uh, this leads to uh, an equation between the carbon and chlorophyll uh, for phytoplankton that can be used in a remote sensing uh, context. So then um, it allows us to reconcile the estimates of uh, primary production um, that I've just been talking about versus the kind where the growth of phytoplankton is, uh, is given in units of inverse time and, for example, the, the turnover of carbon per unit carbon per unit time. So the steps uh, you can see there, uh, we start with the chlorophyll field, and we convert this, or we have the um, uh, particulate uh, carbon field from the previous figure, and the field for the carbon contained in phytoplankton, and therefore we get the carbon to chlorophyll A ratio. We get the, um, the turnover of um, phytoplankton per unit chlorophyll at light saturation, uh, also with the aid of remote sensing. I won't show that now. And we can combine all those data to get in the lower right panel uh, uh, the field of um, specific growth uh, in carbon per unit carbon per unit time. So this, this, was, this was long for a long time one of the principal goals of uh, biological oceanography. Now, um, if you look at the bottom uh, part of this slide, you will see that the light that goes into photosynthesis is only a small part of the light which is absorbed by the phytoplankton. Most of the light goes into, uh, uh, most of the light is dissipated as heat by phytoplankton and gets used to actually heat the surface water. So, the um, presence of chlorophyll changes the thickness or the depth of the layer over which the solar energy is dissipated. So here we see on the left-hand side a region of low chlorophyll where the 
sun's photons can penetrate rather deeply. And of course, ulti ultimately, they're all going to be used to heat the water, but the layer over which this heating occurs is rather deep. Compared with the case on the right-hand side, where the chlorophyll concentration is much higher, and because of the stronger absorption, therefore, the layer over which the uh, water is being heated is uh, less deep. So there are consequences for the physical uh, dynamics, in particular the seasonal changes in uh, mixed layer depth. I can show you here an example in the top from the Labrador Sea. There's the, the uh, Along the bottom of these uh, figures are the uh, different months. In other words, it's a time scale. And the uh, ordinate is a depth scale. And what is being plotted is the change in the temperature on a seasonal basis that is due to the presence of chlorophyll. In other words, it's the difference in what the temperature would be if there were, if this place was biologically sterile, and between that situation and the situation where the chlorophyll uh, concentration changes seasonally in the observed way. So for the Labrador Sea, you can see that the difference in the surface temperature that we can ascribe to the phytoplankton presence gets up to a maximum of 1.5 degrees. The lower panel, um, which is a shallower place, there's the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, uh, you can see that in the late summer, the water is warmer because of the phytoplankton, by 2.5 degrees compared with what it would have been if there were no phytoplankton. In the Arabian Sea, which is where the Shuba made the first such calculation, uh, the um, biological heating was order, uh, one, uh, heating rate was order one degree uh, per month. So these are, um, major influences in the seasonal change in mixed layer depth, and they can also be studied using ocean color. Now, another topic, it relates to the um, taxonomy of the phytoplankton. So far, we talked only about chlorophyll, which is a very uh, widely distributed pigment, I mean widely in a taxonomic sense. But phytoplankton also contain auxiliary pigments and those vary from taxa to taxa. And they also, phytoplankton also occupy, as we discussed earlier, a very wide size range. And both size range and pigment composition modify the optical characteristics of phytoplankton. So we look at that uh, next. So here, for example, you can see the variability in absorption spect spectra of phytoplankton with the community structure. You can see um, on the right-hand side the spectra being normalized to make the comparison uh, uh, more, easy, more easy. And you can see the differences um, between the taxa. And bear in mind that the underwater light field is being modified by these absorption spectra. So different taxa will modify the underwater light field in different ways. 
then uh, we have to look at the functional attributes of different phytoplankton taxa. When we spoke about primary production, we spoke about the fixation of carbon. Uh, we showed the figures for uh, global distribution. But phytoplankton also modify not just the carbon cycle, but also the, the planetary cycles of other elements, including silicon, nitrogen, iron, uh, calcium, and so on. So those are um, what we look at next. If, if you consider um, a conventional ecosystem models, such as this one by Michael Fasham, there was a pool for phytoplankton, a pool for zooplankton, a pool for nitrate and one for detritus. So all of the phytoplankton are contained in the same box. And these days, uh, it's considered uh, more useful to separate that phytoplankton box into uh, different boxes depending on the kinds of phytoplankton uh, available. So, for example, we have the ones that uh, have a requirement for silicon. Uh, they use the silicon to make a heavy uh, shell or um, frost uh, tool. And because it's heavy, it makes the phytoplankton sink faster and therefore is important in the uh, export of carbon from away from the surface. Yesterday, you heard a nice lecture about calcifying organisms. There is another group of organisms that, um, that produce a compound called DMS that may escape to the atmosphere and provide a nuclei for the con condensation of clouds. So there may there may be an influence of the presence of phytoplankton on, on the local cloudiness. Um, there is a group of phytoplankton called picophytoplankton. They, they, are, uh, they might not be eukaryotic cells. They're often uh, prokaryotic cells. But the, the point is that they are very, very small. And because they are small, their tendency to sink is very much reduced. So if we have a community dominated by these, it's going to sink less fast than if we have one uh, community dominated by uh, organisms that need silicon. In other words, uh, the diatoms. And then we have nitrogen fixing organisms. Uh, so there are five examples of phytoplankton that have uh, vastly different effects on the uh, biogeochemistry of the ocean. And that's a justification for putting them, uh, for separating them out in uh, ecosystem models for the ocean. So um, th this, this kind of uh, model that uses the uh, separation of phytoplankton groups is called a dynamic green ocean model. Green, green just means they pay more attention to the phytoplankton. And the different boxes of, uh, that are assigned to different... Uh, phytoplankton types refer to the so-called phytoplankton functional groups. So these are the uh, models of uh, choice these days in um, carbon cycle uh, and biogeochemical cycle research. So uh, we've been talking about uh, diatoms. Uh, can we... Um, 
identify or can we discriminate using ocean color the presence of diatoms in uh, the local um, phytoplankton community? The answer is that you can, and this is uh, using an algorithm published by Shuba. This shows the coast of uh, east coast of Canada in the spring and in the summer. So using the algorithm that tells you for each pixel in the image the likelihood uh, that that, that, that the phytoplankton community at that pixel is dominated by diatoms or is not dominated by diatoms. Uh, you see on the left side uh, that uh, strong um, yellow and orange color shows the typical uh, spring condition in temperate latitudes of um, uh, spring bloom diatom community, whereas in the summer uh, this is uh, this is not the case in the same place, but but there are um, diatoms in the Labrador Sea, and in that area, uh, w even though it's the summer oceanographically. Uh, that area is still in the springtime because only the ice ice will only just have uh, retreated now um, so that's uh, maybe interest <coughs> interesting from uh, from the point of view of a phytoplankton specialist does anybody care um, here for example is uh, a picture published by French group uh, based on work in South Africa. And is, uh, some of the students may know that, um, especially according to the Spanish uh, ecologist uh, Margalef, diatoms are favored in an environment that is turbulent whereas flagellates are favored in an environment that uh, is uh, stratified. So this is a, a, a big generalization. So if you have the conditions that lead to uh, diatom dominance, you have a food chain uh, that ends up um, in uh, anchovies. Whereas, uh, if you have uh, a s more stratified conditions that lead to flagellate dominance, then your small pelagic is m more likely to be in this uh, Benguela current system, is more likely to be sardine. So, than the the market value of those uh, two groups uh, will not be the same. So here we can see uh, a practical fisheries consequence of a change in the community structure of the phytoplankton, and, and that change is something that can be observed and uh, monitored by uh, ocean color science. Um, now, that was about diatoms. Um, one of the interesting topics in uh, food chain research is about the fatty acids. And the fatty acids um, are synthesized by phytoplankton. It's the principal source in the entire universe. And, but the different fatty acids are associated with different uh, taxa. So here um, we see it also in the, in the uh, Eastern Canadian uh, shelf. Uh, you can see in the top right one uh, particular fatty acid called EPA. And it's um, 
So that, those are measurements by, uh, by chemical specialist versus the diatom chlorophyll as retrieved by the algorithm that we were just talking about. And uh, on the basis of this kind of relationship, uh, we have produced these uh, maps of um, large-scale distribution of uh, fatty acids uh, per unit uh, phytoplankton carbon. So that's an emerging area of uh, research. Now, as well as the pigments that the phytoplankton contain, the size of the cells also has, a, has an effect on, the, on their optical properties because uh, the, the um, different size cells scatter in, in different ways and different, the, the chlorophyll um, contained in the, in the uh, chlorophyll contained in different size cells um, absorbs differently depending on how, um, how much it's uh, concentrated in those cells. So um, one of our colleagues, uh, Chauvin Lau Roy, has made um, a rather nice um, uh, study that allows him to estimate uh, from the optical signals the uh, typical diameter of the um, phytoplankton cells on, on a global scale. That's the picture on the right. And the picture on the left shows the absorption uh, uh, per unit chlorophyll of uh, different uh, phytoplankton size groups, the so-called picoplankton, the nanoplankton, and the microplankton. So by um, analyzing those, uh, the properties of the different size groups, uh, we can uh, end up with some estimate of the microbial uh, size spectrum in the ocean. So why is that uh, interesting? It means that if you know something about the size spectrum, it means you can apply a lot of uh, ecological theory that is based on size. So... Um, this uh, is useful in fisheries, but it's useful in also in a theoretical uh, sense. So I've worked on this in the past, and somebody else who's worked on it and still does is uh, Professor Quinones here. Uh, so the, the ability to have information about the size spectrum uh, from uh, from ocean color is allows allows us to make a connection with this uh, very, uh, rather powerful body of theory. Now I've got, I have one more uh, topic to discuss, and this is the this is the uh, use of data from ocean color to assist in uh, implementation of um, uh, ecosystem-based management. So this, now this is an operational kind of, a, kind of an application. So there is a, there is a sense, consensus in the world. Actually, it's now a declaration of the United Nations that when we, when we deal with the marine uh, resources, we should uh, handle them in an ecosystem-based manner. It means that the, the integrity of the ecosystem should not be uh, damaged. So this uh, declaration, which was written by lawyers, it, say, it, 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 it contains... Uh, 
language such as the health, the vigor, and the resilience of the ecosystem. They, they, they should be maintained. But in fact, uh, these are rather subjective uh, concepts and they're difficult to quantify. We would prefer to have a suite of objective indicators rather than these more subjective ones uh, as, as an aid to ecosystem-based management of fisheries or, or any marine resources. So the indicators would be objective metrics for the for pelagic ecosystem that could be applied in a serial mode or an operational mode to detect any changes in the ecosystem that may occur in response to perturbations. Perturbation could be climate change, it could be overfishing or whatever. It turns out that remote sensing meets many of the requirements of an ideal set of indicators because it's uh, repeatable at, at, at high frequency, nominally one day. It's very low cost and can be applied at a variety of scales. The measurement is instantaneous and we can uh, develop a time series. So there is, uh, remote sensing has a lot going for it in this uh, context. So how do we get the time series? Simply, we take a series of images at the same place, we select the area of interest, and for every image, we extract the information we want. This, here it's shown the chlorophyll biomass of, uh, of uh, or the phytoplankton biomass index by chlorophyll as a function of time. So when you have such um, time series, in most latitudes, uh, the, it will be clear that the seasonal signal is a, is a key feature. And in the seasonal uh, cycle, the spring bloom is the dominant event. So uh, remote sensing now gives us the, the means to quantify this uh, phenomenon in an objective way. So, for example, this is a cartoon of a spring bloom. Uh, there will be a maximum that we, can, that we can quantify. That maximum will occur at a certain time, which we can quantify. The, there'll be a, a, another point in the time series at which we can say, according to some criterion, that the, the spring bloom has now begun. And, and, and a time interval over which we can say the uh, spring bloom uh, uh, lasted. Now, all of the, these indices, um, there's a possibility that they will, uh, any, any of them or all of them, will vary between years. And as far as I'm concerned, the only way that you can check that statement at the bottom, the only way you can do is using remote sensing, uh, which we did. And we were very surprised to find that the interannual variation, for example, in the peak timing, uh, could vary by uh, more than a month from year to year to me was uh, somewhat staggering. So what, uh, for what can you use such information? Um, there is, uh, in the fisheries literature, there is an hypothesis that says the recruitment to a fishery will be good when the spring bloom is matched in some way to the spawning and recruitment will be poor when the, um, when the spring bloom is not matched to the spawning. So this is the, the so-called uh, mass match, mismatch hypothesis of Cushing, but it had never been tested. It's just, uh, it wasn't possible to test it 
in, uh, in an operational sense. So we made a test of this thing for, um, for a certain gadoid fish called a haddock. You have haddock here? Uh, no, 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 it's a gadoid fish um, that is, has a good market value. And the larvae are in the uh, plankton. Uh, they metamorphose and go to the bottom and um, spend their life as, uh, rest of their life as demersal, demersal fishes. Now, in, in my institute, there was a 30-year time series of um, data on recruitment of these uh, haddock. And for the years in which um, ocean color data were available, uh, we could calculate the properties of this, um, the, the metrics on this picture, for which the general, uh, general name we can use is the, the phenology. Phenology means events, uh, timing of events in a, in a life cycle. So if you look at the results there on the right side, you can see that um, on the ordinate is the larval survival normalized to spawning stock biomass. And on the uh, abscissa, we can see uh, estimates of the timing of the spring bloom. So they're in the form of anomalies. It means that the negative ones, uh, negative numbers, mean uh, the spring bloom in, those, in, in a particular year was late compared with the climatological average. The positive numbers uh, are positive means that the spring bloom was early compared with the climatological average. And I think it's quite uh, clear to see that in the years when the spring bloom was uh, very early, that the recruitment, recruitment tended to be uh, excellent. So that's a, that's a useful result for fishery managers and to my mind uh, could not have been attained by any way, any method except using um, these ocean color time series. So and we can get other ecological indices, not just the metrics for the spring bloom. Uh, we, by now we have a list of about 20 of them don't have time to review them all. So what are the applications of these kind of um, data and these kind of indicators? In the harvest uh, uh, fisheries case, we, the fishermen use them, and this is very well developed in India, fishermen use them to find the places of uh, maximum uh, uh, potential uh, fishing yield, and they go directly to these places and therefore economize on, uh, on fuel and on time. In fisheries management, they're useful for, uh, to understand the causes of um, interannual fluctuations, perhaps, um, interannual fluctuations in fisheries as driven by uh, ecosystem fluctuations. In the aquaculture industry, we can use them to estimate uh, carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is really uh, related to primary production and also to monitor the, monitor the incidence and the fate of uh, harmful blooms, which I understand is a, a hot topic uh, in this area right now. Um, they can be used to, uh, in applications for protection of species at risk by identifying uh, exclusion zones that reduces bycatch of, uh, 
uh, of species at risk. They can be used to delineate uh, marine protected areas. As you see, the nice uh, detail we get um, with these in the chlorophyll fields. Um, the ecosystem indicators are very useful for uh, discussions of uh, ecosystem health and ecosystem services. And finally, uh, there is the topic of high, high seas governance, uh, where the um, uh, this is a future a future uh, application where some rational procedures will be introduced to um, control or govern the parts of the ocean that are outside jurisdiction of any one nation. That really means most of the, the vast majority of the, uh, of the ocean surface. So um, to summarize, uh, the ocean color uh, method is the only window we have on synoptic scales into the pelagic ecosystem. It's an integrating discipline because it touches on uh, most aspects of marine science, uh, both research and uh, operational. And it's, relative, it's relevant for societal benefit areas such as climate change, fisheries, and protection of uh, biodiversity. It's not a universal panacea. Uh, there are limitations. But because this is our only window, we have to learn to live with the limitations and make the most of the uh, benefits. And it's certainly uh, cost effective. In this field, in its short uh, lifetime, uh, say uh, the data have been in the public domain since uh, 1986. I mean, it started before that, so let's say 1978, but most people couldn't get the data. So 1986 means uh, 30 years, right? So in that time, uh, much has been accomplished, but there, there does remain a great deal yet to do, and I would recommend it to people who are just starting out as uh, a field to consider because there's a great deal of interest in it. So uh, thank you very much. So what, I stand a bit over here. Whether you're talking about um, uh, governance or management, uh, it has to have a rational basis. Okay. So um, and the uh, rational basis, uh, to my mind, has to be uh, has to has to involve ecological science. I say this um, because uh, in Canada, we had uh, an interesting experience with a boundary dispute between Canada and the United States. 
on this same east coast that I, for which I showed some pictures. And the, the boundary that was in dispute went through a, a, a fishing bank called George's Bank that uh, was, was a very rich place for fisheries. And the Canadian case was built entirely on this kind of ecological uh, science. And Canada thinks it uh, did very well using such an argument. So you project now to the open ocean, uh, which uh, to, you know, to a casual glance is featureless. We have to uh, impose uh, somehow some rational structure to start, uh, whether it's the delineation of um, marine protected areas that are uh, extra national jurisdiction. You know, the, the, the protected areas we have to date are there because they're so designated by a particular maritime nation. Now there is a move to have such areas that would be declared by common agreement and not, not because of uh, allocation of something within one's own uh, territorial jurisdiction. So that has to be, if you, if you were going to make such a decision, you would try to incorporate some ecological science and the starting point to me is the, these ocean color fields. I know, for example, that um, the World Wildlife Fund, I don't know, uh, do, do, do you understand that in, uh, oh, you have a different word. World Wildlife Fund is very interested in these data, you know, for, for example, um, in the conservation of, uh, or protection of whales, uh, they, it's known that the whales uh, like to congregate around oceanographic fronts, okay? So it's very useful for these people to have all the fronts mapped and uh, their variability, so on. Uh, so this would be the basis for me of rational management or rational uh, governance. Yeah. 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 Uh, the first question is about um, uh, the use of uh, all the um, indicators uh, of, uh, that you uh, show us uh, in fisheries. Yes. Um, somehow this uh, uh, it could, could um, fit in the more kind of bottom-up uh, control in, 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 in the marine ecosystems. Yes. And, but uh, there's some uh, ecosystem you see that sometimes where you have great uh, primary production, not necessarily you have uh, big uh, fishes. Right. So there might be some interactions with other kinds of controls. Uh, maybe to, to them, I don't know, or what's what, uh, some people have many hypotheses. And the other question is about uh, we are experiencing in Chile uh, big uh, algal, algal blooms, uh, mostly harmful. And I would like to your uh, opinion about well these blooms are well they are harmful for us because they normally have toxins that affect the, the humans but are those uh, blooms also uh, disruptions for the entire uh, entire ecosystems? Uh, maybe okay. That's, uh, okay. Thank you. So first question. Um, the uh, generally on on a world scale, there is a correlation between primary production, or at least uh, in a 
a component of the prime production that's referred to as new production. There's a, a, there's a correlation between that and the potential fish yield, but it's no more than a general correlation. And as you say, there can be vari va variations uh, from this um, relationship. But the, the application I showed to the fisheries was not a function of the intensity of the production, but only a function of the timing. So uh, whether it's, um, for, uh, that, that was a vertebrate fish that I showed. We've, we have a sim similar example in, uh, in the invertebrates. It was a pandalid uh, shrimp. That the, the timing of the events in the year is um, also relevant. You can have the same the same magnitude of spring bloom can have a different effect from one year to another depending on the phase of the seasonal cycle. So, for the, in the case of the shrimp that we studied, uh, the, the spawning uh, timing of spawning of these things uh, and you know they carry the eggs for for a long time before the the eggs are actually uh, hatched and the time the time of uh, this uh, egg carrying depends on the temperature and so on we found that from one stock to another this timing was very conservative uh, whether that's made that way by evolution, uh, one doesn't know. Whereas the year-to-year uh, -year fluctuations in, in, um, at the level of uh, phytoplankton, that's quite volatile. You know, it's, it's as volatile as the weather from one year to, to the next. So uh, there's a lot to learn, I would say, about um, ecosystem fluctuations, successive fisheries, um, and we can, we can attack that using these nice data. So that's the first question. Go, going to the, to the second question, um, the harmful blooms uh, are not always easy to, um, how can I say, to discriminate, certainly to the level of a species, because it, the, the, it's the species more so than the general taxa that, that may or may not contain uh, toxin. Uh, to separate them optically is quite difficult. So we have tried and we've made a certain progress, but that's something for future research. We have to do it because uh, the industry is, how can I say, the, the security of the industry into the future depends on it, I would say. So we have to get better at that. Now, on a world scale, the uh, incidence of reporting of harmful blooms uh, is, is increasing. Whether this means that the occurrence of the blooms is on the increase or whether it's just that people are more acutely aware of it and more inclined to report them, that's a, another story. But uh, if you have such a bloom, uh, does it affect the rest of the ecosystem? Um, uh, yes, it does. Uh, you can see, because the, these blooms will modify, for example, the local um, oxygen, dissolved oxygen concentration. 
So I can show you a picture in my computer, if you're interested, of a beach in South Africa where uh, offshore there had been uh, a red tide. The oxygen uh, concentration had been depleted. And all of the uh, lobsters walked out onto the beach and the local people were just collecting lobsters on the beach because they had fled from this uh, occurrence of um, low oxygen. So potentially uh, the effect of the blooms can be much more broad, more complicated than just the ones that directly affect humans. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions or thoughts for Trevor? No? Well, I guess. Uh, I have a question, maybe not directly related with the ocean color, but probably in some sense, yes. Uh, what do you think about the uses of iron? to improve uh, some fisheries, as salmon fisheries, uh, used in, the, in uh, Canada, for example, yep. the years ago. Yeah. The, um, so the, the ecological basis of that uh, question is that uh, many people believe in certain areas of the world, the growth of phytoplankton, is limited by lack of iron. Uh, we have studied this problem and uh, we can reproduce the same conditions as these, as the so-called uh, HNLC conditions. We can rep reproduce those without invoking any iron lack, uh, just, because, just by looking at the um, the effect of uh, deep mixing on the prime production. In fact, Osvaldo was involved with this in the early part of that work. So that's the ecological basis. Now, um, the uh, addition of iron with a view to uh, stimulating fisheries is, uh, in principle, is forbidden by the London dumping convention. So what, what one is not supposed to do that. Um, the, they had an, the, there was an exemption given in the particular case of this iron fertilization for research purposes. Um, uh, but it was uh, politically, it's a marginal thing. At the time this uh, dumping convention a uh, decision was made. There was a German cruise on its way to, uh, I think, to the Southern Ocean to, to do more, uh, more experiments. And uh, the, the cruise was uh, halted because of all this discussion. Now, with respect to the example you mentioned, the Canadian one, uh, we were involved with this thing on the periphery. Not with the iron addition, I, I must insist, but uh, we were talking to the people beforehand about uh, remote sensing. We had no clue there was any iron was in the, uh, was in, uh, coming, but they they want the the situation there is there was there's an island or group of islands called the Queen Charlotte Islands, which is a traditional a native home for a group of um, Canadian Indians called the Haida. And in fact, the names of, name of this group of islands has now been changed from Queen Charlotte Islands to the Haida Gwaii. And uh, we were asked to help them about remote sensing which we were glad to do. And then uh, 
sometime later we found out what they had done and uh, really that's um, I think it's forbidden by international if it's not international law it's a, it's a convention that uh, many countries have subscribed to so controversial you know uh, th this um, this British scientist called um, James Lovelock. You, you, you've heard of him? He, he's the one who's written all these books on the, the Gaia hypothesis. He, he's a, a chemist by origin and outstanding scientist. But uh, he says that the people who call themselves um, geoengineers Geoengineers means manipulation like this. He refers to them as pornographers. So he give you an idea. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank for you. Being here with us.